worshiping together in person or online this morning, let us stand as we are able to sing our first song together. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your sins. My story isn't over, my story has just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Welcome to worship, everyone. My name is Abby Eccles. I'm the campus pastor here at Mosaic as part of First Methodist Sherman. I'm so glad we're all here worshiping either in person or online this morning. So a few announcements. First, for those who are here in person, we have attendance pads. If you wouldn't mind filling those out, leaving us your info or maybe any updated information you have, we'd love to get you connected with all the awesome things going on this Lenten season here at First Methodist Sherman. 
We also have bowls in the back of the worship space for your tithes and offerings. And we also have a prayer table in the back as well where you can lift up your prayers in different ways while we are worshiping today. So feel free to go check that out at any point while we're here today. If you're worshiping with us online this morning, drop your name in the comments. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. We also have two links that are tagged at the top of the, co the comments. One of them is for the giving link, and one of them is a prayer form. Um, you can leave your tithes and offerings that way, or you can also share your prayers and prayer requests with us in that way, and our staff will be praying with you um, in the days and weeks to come. So we hope that you will uh, step into those spaces as needed as we worship today. A couple other announcements. We have Lent Bible studies that are starting this week on Wednesdays. Pastor Denise is leading one of those at noon. And then Pastor Denise and I are leading two different ones on Wednesday nights at 630 over at the main campus. So if you are able to come by and uh, participate in those Lenten studies, we would so appreciate that. I know the couple that Denise is leading have books with them. So if you would like to jump in on Denise's Bible studies, they're two separate studies. Um, holler at Pastor Denise and she'll, we'll all get you connected. Um, and the, let's see what else. Oh, and the Bible study that I'm leading is at 630 on Wednesday nights. It's going to be a deeper dive into our Lenten sermon series that we're actually starting today. So if you would like to dive a little bit deeper into the scriptures that we'll be looking at for this season, uh, this will be your Bible study. So we hope that you will join us during this season, which will surely be good as we journey toward the cross and ultimately toward Easter. We've got uh, another announcement about the garage sale and taco sale that's happening on March 26th over at Vecinos Ministries. Last week, uh, we mentioned that if you do have things that you would like to donate to this garage sale, we would love to have those things. Pastor Floor is actually, she's been out of town for the last week. I believe she's back in town, but um, not quite in the office just yet. But if you have items that you would like to donate toward Vecinos Ministries, holler at Pastor Floor, F-L-O-R, at First Methodist Sherman, and make an appointment with her to make sure uh, that she or someone will be there whenever you come to drop off your things at Vecinos Ministries. If you have questions about that, holler at me or holler at one of us in the church office at any point in the next week or so. There's also a pre-sale for tacos ahead of time, so if you would like tacos for that day, holler at Pastor Floor. She'll get you connected there as well. Easter is coming up in a few weeks, and just before Easter, we always celebrate Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, we're going to have this huge all-church lunch and we're going to have an Easter egg hunt for our kiddos. So this is something for everyone, for the whole family. Um, there is a sign-up genius that is uh, going to be circulating through the Facebook page and on our website and in emails if you receive the emails. Um, there's going to be a sign-up genius to bring all kinds of different picnic-y kinds of food, um, like salads, sandwiches, the whole nine. We're going to have a fun kind of bingo sort of game for all of us, like an intergenerational kind of thing where we all kind of go around and get to know each other a little bit. And also, we're going to have a Easter egg hunt for kids. The Easter egg hunt, in order to make that happen, we need eggs and candy. So if you would like to bring eggs and candy, you can bring that on Sundays during worship. You can take it up to the church office, whatever you prefer. If you have questions about any of that, you can just holler at me, and we'll get you connected. I think that's it for our announcements this morning. So at this time, let us stand as we are able and say a statement of our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Oh, you may be seated. So this morning, 
This morning, I'm going to be preaching from perhaps the best known parable in the New Testament. I'm going to be preaching from the prodigal. No, that's the wrong one. I'm going to be preaching from the Good Samaritan. And so, uh, see, they both, notice they both hold the same weight in my mind. They are the best known of the parables that Jesus told. Those other ones, not these two, right? But today we're going to talk about the Good Samaritan. And the problem with the Good Samaritan is you don't even have to go to church to understand something about what it means to be a Good Samaritan because there are hospitals and nonprofit organizations and all kinds of other things that have the word Samaritan in them or the Good Samaritan, like the Good Samaritan Hospital, Samaritan's Purse. You've heard of some of these things. The problem is, is with the Good Samaritan is that there's just not a whole lot left to be preached on about that. Every pastor I know has preached on the Good Samaritan at least once. And very often, as my preaching professor would say, it's usually three points in a poem. And so it's really hard to find something else to say about this text. And so, like all other pastors, we really struggle with this. But it's a really good text for us. And I think part of the problem we have with it is because we usually hear this text as if it stands all alone. Like Jesus just stopped what he was doing and decided today he would tell that parable. And that's not how any of the Gospels are. There's always a context for when things are told. And so we're going to put this parable in its context so we get a broader picture of what's going on so that we don't think that this story is a standalone story because it's not. It's part of the Gospel of Luke and it's part of a much larger story. And the fact is, is that Jesus is telling this story after 70 disciples return from going and spreading the gospel in towns and cities all around Jericho and all along the Jericho Road. So Jesus sends out these 70 disciples. He tells them, uh, you know, the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. You go out without, without carrying anything, without a purse, without a staff. And, you know, you go to people's homes, and if they accept you, you bless their home, you heal the people in their city, um, and, and this is how the gospel will be spread. And if not, then you shake the dust off your feet and you move on. And so they do this. And eventually they come back to Jesus and they are so excited because the gospel has been spread. And they witness to the fact that God is doing a new thing. They saw it with their own eyes. They healed the sick. They ate with people they wouldn't normally eat with. They gathered groups of people together, and they spread the good news, and it was beautiful. In the midst of their excitement, Jesus reminds them, though, that their excitement should come because their names are written in the book of life. In other words, what Jesus says to them is, you are children of God. God knows you, God loves you, and God wants you to be part of this new thing that God is doing. And then Jesus prays. And he prays and he thanks God that the eyes of these little ones, these new disciples, have seen the things of glory and that these very things have been held back from those with power, privilege, and position. And that's where we pick up. And the words start with just then. Just then. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? You know, Jesus never gives a straight answer to anything, right? Like I'm not telling you anything you really don't know. Okay. So a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. 
He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a really strange juxtaposition in this story that happens, right? And you all heard it. One minute we're praying, we're praying and rejoicing, and just then, just then, we go from the innocent who have finally seen the kingdom of God at hand, and then a lawyer stands up. I'm sorry, I know that there are some of you in this room right now, but that's, I can't change the story. Then the lawyer stands up, and wanting to justify himself, he asks this question, well, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He already knows the answer to his question. So we know right away, this has nothing to do with inheriting eternal life, right? The bigger question here is, who is my neighbor? Who counts? Who counts as my neighbor? That's really what he wants to know. Who counts? And I think that's a really valid and important question here, because in Israel at the time, there was a real great division among people. There were Jews, but there were also Samaritans who the Jews hated and Romans who the Jews hated more. And so surely, surely, I do not have to count as my neighbor those Samaritans and those Romans. This is a really important question. And you see, because Jesus has previously sent out 70 people to go and spread the good news. So maybe the question really is not so much who is my neighbor, but who can I exclude from the gospel? Who doesn't count to receive the good news? And really, when I think about this, I have to wonder, where did this lawyer come from anyway? I mean, did you wonder anything about that? Where did this guy come from? The 70 have all come back. So is the lawyer one of the 70? Maybe. Or was he just part of the group of people that liked to show up when Jesus was someplace? There's no way to know that. There's no way to know that. But he knows that something's going on, and he wants some answers. Right? Right? In a divided world, it's important to know who counts. What's really odd here, though, is that at this point in the gospel, by the time you get to this place in the gospel, Jesus has done things that are already one off, right? Way back in the gospel, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. She's sick. He touches her, unclean. Right after that, he helps a woman whose son has died. He touches the body, unclean. Along the way, as he's walking, a bleeding woman touches the hem of his garment, unclean. And then he does the unspeakable, and he heals the daughter of a Roman centurion, the enemy. He heals the daughter of the enemy. Do you see a pattern emerging here? (laughs) And all along the way, His disciples are watching this. The people who are following him are seeing him do this. You would think at this point they're starting to figure out that not only is Jesus willing to risk everything for the sake of the other, but he's expecting that the people who are following him will do the same thing, even for the Roman. It's really disorienting for those people who were watching, perhaps more so for the lawyer who understood the law better than anybody else. You know, we're just not that much different. We live still in a divided world, maybe more divided than I can ever remember it, maybe less so because now we just have all this information at our fingertips, but you know we live in a divided world. We're divided by race and ethnicity and language and custom and culture. 
our politics divide us. And you could say that what we're doing, in effect, is we're creating new enemies. We're creating Samaritans and Romans in our homes, in our workplaces, in all of our social structures, and even within the walls of our churches, we have made divisions possible. We have created a whole new brand of enemies. Pastor and author and um, professor David Lose writes this. In many ways, we are as clan-oriented as those in Jesus' original audience. Most often, we look out first for our immediate and then extended family, and then close friends, and then those who are most like us or share our values or associations. Like the priest and the Levite, we tend to overlook and avoid those who are different from us. And you know, for the most part, that's true for all of us. We avoid people who are different than we are for a whole host of reasons, none of which are good, but we do it because it's comfortable for us to do those things, to keep those people that are just a little bit different at arm's length so that we don't have to figure out if maybe we're the ones who've gotten it wrong. You know, it also doesn't matter if you've been in church your whole life, if you've gone to Sunday school since your earliest memory, if you've read the Bible cover to cover, if you've gone on every mission trip that the church has offered. We all have this, this thing inside of us, this human condition that says to us, we're okay and other people are not especially those people that make us the most uncomfortable, who disagree with us, who don't have the same worldview that we have. Let's keep them at arm's length. Perhaps what we really need to start doing is realizing that um, sometimes those are the people that we're, not only are those the people that we are called to serve and to care the most for and to let into our bubble, but sometimes those are the people who are actually called to serve us and help us and embrace us. Sometimes we are the ones who are left for dead in the ditch and we need a neighbor to show us mercy. We need someone, and I know that's really hard for almost all of us in this room because aren't we the I can pick myself up by my own bootstraps people? I mean, after all, most of us are generally successful at what we do with our lives. And so the idea that we might be left in the ditch and that we might need somebody to help us is really a difficult thing for us to embrace. And I think what's even harder is that very often when we find ourselves in the ditch, the person who shows up to help us is not the person we've expected. It could be the Samaritan, whoever that person happens to be. And that's really hard for us. And I was thinking about this and, and thinking about a trip that I had made to the hospital for a very elderly woman who was part of a congregation I served many years ago. And she did everything. I mean, she was probably, at, at that point, she was in her late 70s. She was totally independent. And at the summer lunch program that was um, hosted through that church, she showed up every day to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, stood up for hours at a time, just slathering that bread and making sure they were in the bags and then greeting the children that were coming for lunch every single day, Monday through Friday, she was there. I mean, she went to every Bible study. She never missed worship. If the church doors were open, she was there. She had some melanomas that needed to be removed. She drove herself downtown to Baylor. Now, most of us don't want to drive downtown to Baylor, right? So she drives herself downtown to Baylor. I'm there right before her surgery. Her nurse is walking out of the room, and I'm walking in. And she says to me, can you close the door? Okay. So I close the door. I'm thinking she doesn't want anyone to hear us praying or talking about whatever we talk about because I was going to stay through the surgery. And she said to me, I'm really worried. And I said, what are you worried about? You know, this is really easy surgery. You're not even going to be under that long. They're going to get rid of this stuff. You're going to be home in two or three days. Um, and she said to me, well, my nurse 
is from Africa. And she whispered it like it was like, a, my nurse is from Africa. Okay, now I'm starting to see what we're scared about, right? And she said, do you think she's qualified? Hmm, I don't know. Baylor hired her. <laughs> right? And she said, well, well, but you know those people. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I said to her, um, Joe, I think you'll be okay. I, and she said, but I don't, you know, like our people there, do they believe in God? Oh, Lordy. Like this was the weirdest conversation I had ever, I, I, like, you know, uh, you have lots of conversations in hospitals. I never expected this. So anyway, we finally prayed. I actually didn't stay at the hospital because I said to her, I think you'll be fine. And there was something in my gut that said, don't stay. Just let her be in the hospital. So the next day I go back in the afternoon. There is singing coming from her room, singing. And they're singing, it is well with my soul. I, I'm thinking, did the choir show up or something? No, it is Miss Joe and the lady from Africa who is her nurse, who happens like to be not just Methodist, but Methodist from Africa, which is not like Methodist from the United States. Let, let's just own that, okay? And they are singing and praying, and they are having the best time, and I just stood there and thought, hmm. There's a, there's a lesson here, right, for all of us. Because, see, the person that we are most afraid who might show up to help us is the Samaritan. That's the Samaritan, right, full of grace and truth. David Lose went on to say in his commentary this, perhaps the only way we can see ourselves as the Samaritan, the person who helps, the one called to give help and healing to those in need, is first to recognize how often we have been the traveler left for dead. Once you've been encountered by radical grace and love, it's hard to look at anything or anyone quite the same. In other words, and this is another pastor's words, we have been neighborized. At some time, we have been the ones who have received grace and mercy, and we have been neighborized. And once we are neighborized, Nothing should be the same. We should be the ones then willing to go and be the neighbor and to receive the grace from others, whether we like them or what they stand for or what side of the line they're on or not. Because at the end of the day, we are called, we are nudged, we are urged, we are invited to take care of one another. You know, ultimately, we all know, right, that Samaritans show up in, in strange places in the world. If you've watched the news at all, you know that there are Samaritans all around the Ukraine right now. Airbnb posted this, this news story recently, how people are actually renting homes and then calling the owners and saying, by the way, we're not going to be there because we want to put a family from the Ukraine in that home, and Airbnb has opened up their rentals for that purpose, right? Total strangers taking care of total strangers. People are in the ditch, and somehow or another, hearts have been opened and mercy is being shown. Medical needs, are, there's some train station. We were watching the news the other night. There's a, there was a news reporter in a train station, and there were tables set up everywhere with doctors and nurses, and a lot of these people were from Poland and from other countries around there taking care of people who needed prescriptions and medical care and, and needed facilities for their ongoing care, for their cancer treatments and diabetes and all of those things. People are just showing up to do that on their own time, on their own dime, risking everything so that they could take care of the people who are in the ditch. I just want us to understand that this story is bigger than just about a guy who passes by who doesn't seem to fit in, right? Because you see, what we have in this space, our hearts, our minds, our souls, are gifted to us by a Samaritan named Jesus. Right? I mean, Isaiah 53 describes this best. 
when here is, here is really the one who saved us from ourselves. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he, he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we counted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. We would not want Jesus to stop by. We wouldn't. Because we wouldn't like the way he looked or the way he smelled or the way he spoke, because guess what? Jesus definitely didn't look like any of us. And he certainly didn't say the things that make us feel good. He is the good Samaritan. He became our neighbor, and it cost him his life. So perhaps on this Lenten journey that we are taking to the cross, we might hear the good news in that, that this Samaritan, this one who was despised and rejected and by whose wounds we have been healed, by his grace and his mercy, we have received all we need for life, no matter where we find ourselves, and especially when we find ourselves in the ditch, naked and dying because he doesn't walk by, he stops by. It is my hope that as we make this journey together, that we will have the courage to pray the prayer, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Just that much. Perhaps it's then that we can go and do likewise. and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out
We've come to the time where we lift up our prayers, and as I read these prayers this morning, let us say together, Lord, hear our prayers. First, for the continued conflict in Ukraine, also may we pray for those who have lost their lives, their homes, their peace of mind. May we also pray for the transformed hearts of leaders who are pushing further and further into this conflict. Let us say together, Lord, hear our prayers. In relation to this, uh, I've seen so much being posted this week and so much shared on the news about the children who are out of place. So many times do we often forget about the children in this conflict, not just it's hard to imagine and seeing the things that we see on television and knowing the chaos that is happening, may we also lift up an extra prayer this morning for the children. Lord, hear our prayers. We have another prayer this morning um, that says, pray for our congregation and for the United Methodist Church as a whole. Let us say together, Lord, hear our prayers. Also, uh, let us pray this morning for a holy Lenten season. As we take the steps from the space we are in today toward the cross, toward the risen Christ that we celebrate on Easter morning, may we spend this time in reflection. May we step into those places of vulnerability and spiritual direction 
and ask ourselves what is getting in the way of our relationship with Christ and how can we strengthen that on our part this season. Let us say together, Lord, hear our prayers. And finally, for those prayers that are silent, that are unspoken, that we carry around with us daily, let us say together, Lord, hear our prayers. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, you are magnificent and beyond anything we could ever think of or dream of. You are good and wonderful and glorious. And God, you made this creation not because you needed it, but because of your overflow of love that you had, that you still have. And not only did you make this creation and make all of us in your image, but you freely chose to enter into this creation which you made through your son, Jesus Christ, who willingly became our neighbor, our friend, our savior. God, we recognize, however, that even though Jesus did what he did and still continues to do, what you can only do, we find ourselves getting comfortable. We find that it's so much easier to show up in the world the way that's easiest for us to show up. Sometimes, God, that is harmful to you. It is harmful to others and even harmful to ourselves. We miss so much with the blinders that we put on our own eyes that we don't get to see the goodness that can come from the ways in which you continue to show up in this world. And sometimes we flat out walk the other direction. But God, you continue to love us. You continue to have faith in us, even whenever our faith in you and in ourselves falls short. And God, we thank you for this. We thank you for the reminders, for the moments where you say, it's okay to be uncomfortable. (laughs) Where you tell us that that space of uncomfortability is where you are calling us so that we might come to know more about your love and about one another. And about how to be a good neighbor like your son, Jesus Christ. Remind us, oh God, to live our lives like Jesus to step into those vulnerable places to help to heal to lead and guide to hope and pray to live help us oh God remain closer to you this season help us to hear and feel your love and presence Help us to share that with all those whom we meet. God, we lift up this prayer this morning with the prayer that your son, Jesus Christ, taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we gather at the table this morning, a reminder that this is God's table. This is the table where Jesus shows up. And because Jesus shows up at this table, everyone is welcome at this table. So you don't have to be a member of this church or a United Methodist, or you know maybe you've just come to church this morning because it felt like the right thing to do, and you've never been here before. And you're welcome at this table because we believe here that Christ not only meets us at this table, but wants to feed us at this table. 
wants to be in relationship with us, to love us, and to care for us. That he is here all the time, and he walks out of this place with us so that we are never alone. So let us hear now the words, the words that Jesus spoke as he gathered around a table with his closest friends. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, he gave God thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was finished, he took the cup. Again, he gave God thanks and praise. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink from this cup, remember me. And so on this day, we remember the things that Jesus has done for us, that he would never walk by, but he always stops by, even as we justify our own behaviors. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ broken and poured out in love for this world. Make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet table. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of your Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Will those who are assisting with communion please come forward at this time?
this time, let us say together the prayer following the sacrament. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. At this time, let us stand as we are able, as we sing our last song together this morning. Also, let it be known that if you feel the need to dance a little, that's okay. You're allowed to do that in this Methodist church, really in any Methodist church. Um, also, I say this sometimes, but it's needed today. If you know the words, sing them. If you don't, sing louder. It's perfect. Let's do it.
that. I'm just not, just not doing it. You should have been here for the practice. That's all I can say. That was great. Um, you know what? We are. We really are children of God. We've, we, have, we don't have to justify ourselves. We need to just stop and say, you know what? I'm just not comfortable. I don't want to stop for that guy, that girl, that issue, that whatever. Own it and let God work on it for God's sakes. We keep saying that we believe in God and that God is doing a new thing. Why don't we let God do a new thing? I mean, why don't we? What's the worst that could happen? We find out that we have more in common with the people that we don't like. I mean, really, is that the worst thing that could happen? And maybe they don't want our love. Maybe that's the worst thing that could happen. And they say, just get away. Okay. But you know what? God still does things in that mess too. Because our God does the impossible thing. And we don't even know what it is. So go and do likewise. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah.